A very good evening. Thank you very much for choosing GH1 TV. This is news tonight, and it's such a delight having you here this evening. Joining me for the next one hour for the top-notch stories, making headlines in the country. Let's look at some of the headlines we have for you tonight before we bring you the details. Coming up in the next one hour, opposition NDC demands arrest and prosecution of Attorney General after accusing him of allegedly tampering with a witness in the ongoing trial of the minority leader, Dr. Kazel Atoforsen, for allegedly causing financial loss to the state to the tune of some 2.37 million euros. So, Minister of Justice, you are not interested in justice. You are interested in just jailing somebody. You have now become the torchbearer of injustice. Meanwhile, the governing MPP says the accusations against the Attorney General are false. The NDC have since his appointment held over 12 press conferences against the person of the Attorney General. What at all do the NDC want from Also ahead, opposition NDC flag bearer John Dramani Mahama vows to discontinue payments of utility bills for his appointees if given the chance to govern again. I believe that people should take up paying their own electricity bills and water like every other Ghanaian does. Tonight we bring you some health, social issues as well as girls in Ejumaku and Nyamesiem appeal to government to implement free sanitary pad policy to help them get access to pads during their menses. In business, plastic manufacturers demand immediate suspension of proposed 5% excise on locally manufactured products. Tonight, we would want to get more details from the plastic manufacturers. You see, plastic production is a high-tech process and therefore not a simple understanding for everyone. Tonight we have these and many other interesting stories making the one hour bulletin. Don't forget we'll be bringing you some sports update. We'll be refreshing you with some entertainment news. We'll also be crossing over and bringing you some international stories. Be my guest, stay with us as we bring you all these stories and many more. The program is news tonight and my name is Kweku Timin. Tonight we start with Insight. And Insight is proudly brought to you by Pepsodent. With Pepsodent, every smile matters. Well, on Inside tonight, let's spend time at the courts as the judge presiding in an ongoing trial of the minority leader, Dr. Kazel Atoforsen, and businessman Richard Jakba has issued a stern warning to the parties involved in the case to be circumspect in their public commentaries. Well, according to her, any attempt by anyone to scandalize the court will not be tolerated since the court is the only institution clothed with the power to determine the matter. Justice Sofia Sewasari Butri sounded this caution while addressing a heavily packed court gathering on Tuesday, May 28, before adjourning the case to June 4, 2024. Well, she said she will not be swayed by the commentaries going on outside the courtroom. EIB Network's legal affairs correspondent Mutala Enusa reports. It appears that two leading political parties, that's the MPP and the NDC, have taken the trial of the minority leader, that's Dr. Kazel Atoforsen and Richard Jakba, to their headquarters. Now, while the opposition NDC is demanding the immediate resignation uh, or dismissal of the Minister of Justice and Attorney General Godfrey Yabua Adame for what they say is witness tampering, the governing MPP is accusing the opposition party of peddling falsehood against the Attorney General. While well, the minority leader, Dr. Kazel Atoforsen, is facing trial for allegedly causing financial loss to the state to the tune of two. 0.37 million euros in the purchase of some ambulances for the Ministry of Health. Let's take a lesson to the NDC first. 
Attorney General Godfrey Odami shot up from his seat to accuse Mr. Richard Japa of defending Atufosin rather than himself. In response to the Attorney General's accusation, Mr. Japa, who was testifying under oath and felt attacked without provocation, dropped a bombshell that Godfrey Odami, the Attorney General, has been, has been having clandestine meetings and telephone conversations with him at odd hours to persuade him to falsely testify against the minority leader, Dr. Atufosin, so that the prosecution can secure a conviction. So Minister of Justice, We are not interested in justice. We are interested in just jailing somebody. She are supposed to be the person who will be delivering justice to your country. You have now become the torchbearer of injustice. <laughs> the immediate and unconditional resignation of or dismissal of Godfrey Dame for bringing the high office of the Attorney General and Minister of Justice into disrepute and public opprobrium. Clearly, Mr. Dame is not fit to hold himself out as Attorney General and Minister of Justice. He is unfit to be the leader of the Ghana Bar. All right, so definitely you would want to get some clearer interpretation into some of the issues that has been raised. My colleague Joshua Nana Kwame Ayera has been monitoring the press conferences of the NDC, and he is with me right here in the studio for a conversation. Joshua, so the NDC produced an audio to back their demand. Uh, what more can you share with me on, in this particular audio? Well, um, I think it would just be ideal to also just refresh our viewers, uh, the memories or the minds of our viewers of how we got here. Because if you remember, it's exactly a week today, Tuesday, mm. when the third accused person, Richard Jakba, um, ended his evidence in chief in court mm. and, um, exactly a week today. And then that is what subsequently led to the court also ordering the counsel, the lead counsel lawyers of Dr. Atoforsen to also start their, with their cross-examination. And it was during that period when revelations were made where the third accused person, Richard Jappa, mentioned that he wanted to be actually detailed and entered into the archives or the books of the courts that he has some uh, materials that he would want to tender. That is what led to the National Communications Office of the NDC, Sami Jainfi, coming out to address the press on some uh, alleged engagement by the Attorney General with uh, relative to the third accused person's testimony, which mm. is to um, allegedly coerce him to also now skew his testimony in favor of the state to prosecute Dr. K. Salatofos, who was then the former deputy finance minister. That very day, which was on the 23rd of May, the office of the attorney general had to now issue a statement and, of course, debunk some of the allegations that were made. If you look at the paragraph two to three of their statement, they indicated that the office of the special, I mean, the office of the attorney general, including uh, any officers within that particular office, including the attorney general himself, have not met or engaged any of the accused persons mm. in this particular issue. That was the genesis of the whole thing. And the NDC started to now pick on that. And then today, they held their press conference and decided that. They have certain audio tapes at their disposal, allegedly, between Attorney General, who is also the Minister uh, for Justice, and the third accused persons, and a sitting um, uh, Supreme Court judge on this particular matter. Mm. The essence of the audio, which was just about 16 minutes and five seconds, was recorded on the 9th of April, 2024, today, between, allegedly, between the acu third accused person, Jakba, Richard Jakba, and the Attorney General, that is Godfrey Yeboah Dami. Mm. Where, if you listen to the audio tape, which was actually played um, during the presentation, it suggests or presupposes, allegedly, that the Attorney General was uh, in a bed trying to convince the third accused person, allegedly, 
to skew his testimony mm. in favor of uh, the state so that the state can have the upper hand to prosecute the deputy finance minister, the then deputy finance minister, and now the minority leader, Dr. Kessiela, to forcing. And it all has to do with the procurement of the ambulances, which we are looking at now. If you listen to the audio tape, you realize that allegedly the said person, that is uh, in this case, the, uh, the Attorney General, mm. uh, Godfrey Diabuadami, was trying to convince the third accused person, Richard Jakba, to go by his line of the story so that it will make things less easier, if not difficult, for him in the court, which is per the procurement plan and the agreement, that is to procure these ambulances. They were supposed to come in tranches, 50, 50, 50 out of the, the entire 200. Mm. And because of the agreement purposes and also for the state benefit, there was a condition precedence. The condition precedence was set by an LC, which is a letter mm. of credit. That's right. The letter of credit was supposed to serve as a security for the state. That's what it does. Exactly. For the uh, one procuring the ambulances so that there will not be any advance payment. Mm. What is going to be is that from the point of origin where they are going to now transport the ambulances, the LC was going to be as the payment, but this time around on paper as an agreement. So once you send in the ambulances, you cannot take the LC to the, um, 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 the Ghana International Bank so that they can now waive and then bring you your payment. Mm. But in this case, the third accused person is saying that that is not what the exact story is all about. The LC, which the paired audio tape allegedly, the Attorney General doesn't want that to be included as the condition but precedence, should actually be shelved. Should I bring you into the court and try to find out how is the NDC, through Johnson Asiedun Ketia, now trying to use this audio or its evidence to say, look, arrest the Attorney General? Now, following um, last week, Thursday and Tuesday's incident that happened, mm. the trial that we saw, I mean, today ends the, exact, the cross examination trial. The NDC made some revelations in court. And then, of course, the third accused person also made some revelations in court, which the party, that is the opposition NDC, realized that it is not the way the attorney general is supposed to conduct himself. It goes okay. contrary to the ethics and conduct of a lawyer. And also, it, it also contravenes the, the rule 2020 of LI 2428. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you look at the criminal uh, code, also section 213214, it is not supposed to be that case. So they well, feel like- Joshua, I'm sorry for having to push you into a corner where you're answering like a lawyer already. <laughs> but don't worry, you've done great so far. I'll get a right. lawyer also support me and then I'll come back to you. Right. But let's get the side, the reaction we're getting from the new patriotic party. Now, the MPP has been responding to the issues raised by the NDC. Let's take a listen to what the MPP has been saying. Now, here is Frank Davis, a member of the legal team of the governing MPP, speaking at a press conference a while ago. If at all, the only prosecution in this instance is the malicious and perennial dislike of the NDC tells the Attorney General since he, assu he assumed office and the several attempts made by the NDC to stultify his work. The records are there clearly to show that right from his appointment as Attorney General, the NDC has spent one of the longest periods in our constitutional veteran system with the hope of, Im of impeaching his appointment. But the Attorney General remained resolute to their administration. You all watched the live telecast of his veteran in Parliament and you saw what the NDC took him through. He survived the storm, and he's still our competent attorney general. Having failed in all these endeavors, the NDC filed a motion for censure to remove Godfrey Dami from office as attorney general soon after his appointment, but this also failed. The NDC have since his appointment held over 12 press conferences against the person of the attorney general. What at all? Do the NDC want from this young man? All right, so let me go to a legal practitioner at this moment and try to uh, gauge the mood of both sides and really what the impact of all these evidence and counter accusations have on the substantive case. Lawyer Yao Dankwa is a private legal practitioner. Counsel, thank you very much for joining me this evening. So <laughs> Justice Ifiasawa should be in a difficult position at this moment with all the information 
coming out at this moment and counter accusations. Can you share with us, having followed this matter closely, well, so this evening, what has been coming up, the impact that all coming out with could have on the substantive case? Right, okay. I think uh, um, it's, uh, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit disappointed how this whole thing is playing out. It's becoming a bit too political. The case, the substantive case is, is in the court and it's being deliberated upon by a very experienced, a very experienced judge, not a high court judge for that matter, but a court of appeal judge who's sitting as an additional uh, high court uh, judge in the matter. And it looks as if the politicians are taking the trial from the courtroom into the public domain. Uh, domain. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, both the reaction from the NBC and MPP are really putting the whole judicial system into disrepute. They should allow the uh, court of competent jurisdiction who are vested with all the facts of the case to make a proper determination as to the guilt or innocence of the uh, person standing trial. I don't know how grim these accusations are, I mean, in terms of law, but there are calls for the Attorney General to step down. Are these fair calls? Well, you know, um, of course, you know, if there's been an allegation and uh, uh, it is our right as a citizen, it is our right as a citizen to uh, request that the Attorney General steps down if we feel that, you know, his behavior has not been, uh, he's not behaved properly. But of course, he's also uh, a public officer. He should be given the opportunity to tell his side of the story. And as far as I'm concerned, there hasn't been any complaint, a formal complaint made against him for people to demand his resignation. And I think the allegation that has been made if there's a merit in that allegation, it has to be properly investigated. And once that has been investigated and the proper procedures has been followed and the, uh, the conclusion or the uh, final decision of whatever uh, is the outcome, uh, means that he have to resign, of course. And, you know, that, that is what people will demand. And, of course, we'll expect as a good citizen that he does that. But for now, it is just a mere allegation and uh, uh, the you know the politicians are uh, seized upon uh, this time especially in this campaign period where every political party wants to score points uh, and everybody wants to see what they are, you know say but I believe that the first allegation was made in court so let's leave this judge who is a very competent judge to make a determination as to whether or not there is a merit in what has been said or not and if there is then of course we all know what to do but it is a bit unfortunate as a, a, a person who is a practitioner mm. when, of course, an allegation is made against another uh, a, a practitioner, then, of course, you know, it sends a very uh, shock waves into uh, the community and the fraternity and the people who rely on our services for justice. So what I would say is that let's, every, you know, let's uh, the politicians pull things down and let the whole process play out in court. And that's what a court is there for. All right, lawyer, so share with me. I mean, I'm happy you touched on the judge and mentioned her as that competent judge that we should allow her take her decisions. I want to find out from you. So the judge presiding over this case has cautioned the parties to be circumspect. They should be circumspect about especially the public comments that they make here. Uh, do you see this as a worrying trend within the coming days from tonight? Some of the sentiments and comments that we are yet to see pick up. Yeah, you know, uh, I, I mean, we, we have put the judge in a very, very difficult uh, uh, situation. And as far as I'm concerned, given what has have transpired within the last week and these few days, and especially today, you know, um, how are people going to receive the outcome of the trial? You know, those who uh, will be affected by the decision or by the judgment are going to have something to say. Those who are going to be victorious and this will also have something to say. So uh, already, 
we have put the judge in a very, very difficult uh, situation. But what we can all do to salvage the situation and to bring some sanctity into our, uh, our, our judicial system is for parties to shy away from making further comments, giving making further statements, and all these tick for tat uh, 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 tactics or elements that is going on is not helpful at all, both on the NDC part and the MPP side. It is not helpful. They are now becoming their own uh, uh, court judge and jury, and that 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 is not that's not the right thing. And we need to try and salvage the situation. And they are, you know, the politicians need to talk to themselves. Mm. And you have to ensure that there is peace and tranquility, and let the court, you know, let the court do its job. The judge who is sitting on the case okay. is very well experienced mm. and uh, he will deal with the law let, let the law play out for Ghanaians to know that our judicial system actually works that's what I would say Lawyer Dankwa, thank you very much Lawyer Dankwa is a private legal practitioner joining us to speak on the outcomes of the ambulance purchase saga the matter is still in Court. But we'll quickly go back to our earlier story and bring you some details. But just before then, let me wrap up with uh, Joshua. Then. So Joshua, just before I move on to pick the earlier story, let me find out from you. So you listen to the audio. Right. Within 30 seconds, can you share with me how, how worrying to you from your analysis uh, with this audio you listen to? Right. So quick, maybe a quick one just before I go there, just to make some corrections there, that, that the lawyers of Dr. Kessel after forcing were supposed to conclude their cross-examination today, mm. uh, which they started on last, last week, Tuesday, where they demanded six hours, two hours for each examination. Today was supposed to be the last one, but they didn't get to do that. Mm. Now, coming back to the substantive issue, what we realized, or what I realized from the audio was that it sounded as though um, the audio at some point was rushed. So what one would describe, or some would describe it as a doctor, but that would have to be determined by forensic auditing. Um, I can't that is wholly your opinion after listening to after it? After listening to it. So okay. it would have to be subjected to forensic auditing to find out whether it's the actual complete tape or it's an abridged one that was supposed to be for the purpose of presentation. But it's very worrying, as uh, lawyer Dunkwa made mention, that if an issue is in court and we have political parties also trying to now throw in their own concerns and thoughts on this particular matter, we leave the public to have a certain opinion. And then when the court also now be, decides to also pass their ruling or judgment on the case, it could also now give the credit to the court or create an issue of some sort of form of disaffection, depending on who's sitting on the political color mm. and all of that. But the audio that we had, I'm only suspecting or hoping that um, it would actually play out in a certain way that it wouldn't be the NDC in controlling the narrative or the both mm. political parties, whether MPP or NP, NDC, both controlling the narrative. But the court Joshua. should be allowed to um, um, carry out with its own um, duties. Or exactly. The, the, the thoughts of lawyer Dankwa. So Joshua, thank you very much for your thoughts on this one. Let's bring you the earlier story. That's the judge presided in the ongoing trial of the minority leader, Dr. Kazel Atiforsen, and businessman Richard Jackba has issued a stern warning to the parties involved in the case to be circumspect in their public commentaries. Well, according to her, any attempt by anyone to scandalize the court will not be tolerated since the court is the only institution clothed with the power to determine the matter. Justice Ifia Sewa uh, said the Asari Botri sounded this caution while addressing a heavily packed court gathering on Tuesday, May 28th. It was indeed a very charged atmosphere with a very heavily packed courtroom. If you come to the financial and economic courts, you realize that the atmosphere has changed all in relation to the case involving Dr. Castiela Tuforsin, the current minority leader in parliament, and Mr. Richard Jackpa, a businessman who are facing trial for allegedly causing financial loss to the state following an ambulance purchase. In fact, when the matter was called, a lawyer for Dr. Castiela Tuforsin, led by Dr. Aziz Bamba, indicated to the court presided over by Justice Efia Sewa Asariboche that two applications have been filed. One is a request seeking a stay of proceeding, another seeking an order for the inquiries. But those two applications have been adjourned to next Tuesday for consideration because Justice Efia Sewa Asariboche indicated that she wants to deliver a reasoned ruling 
on both applications. The court, however, took notes of comments in public about how politicians, the two political parties especially, are dealing with the matter before the court. The court said anybody who crosses the red line will be dealt with. The court had a moment with the National Communication Officer of the NDC, Sami Jinfi, who made a comment after the last court sitting. The court urged the parties to be very circumspect. What is the reaction of the Attorney General, especially Deputy Attorney General Alfred Biayeboa? The question is, there are calls for the Attorney General to resign. What's your take? That's the decision of the AG to make, but I don't see it that way. I do not see any tension. We are prosecuting our case. They are defending their clients, and that's how the legal system works. So far as we are doing our work in court, we continue to do it and nothing else. Sami Jenfi, the National Communication Officer of the NDC, welcomes the uh, call from the court, but also took time to explain his point, his comments, after the last court sitting. Uh, no, in principle, um, um, for the sanctity of the administration of justice, the court will always ensure that uh, commentary on matters that are sub judice are responsible and done with circumspection so that the court is not scandalized. So, in principle, the caution of the court was in order, and it is something that we in the NDC agree with, and that is why, right from the outset, we have been very circumspect in whatever we say on this case and have ensured that the court is not in any way or form scandalized. Justice Efia Sewa Sariboshi has said that she wants to deliver a reasoned ruling on both applications that have been filed. And so the case has been adjourned to next Tuesday for the motions to be heard. And the court will have to make a determination as from the law court complex here in Accra. Mutala Inusa, GH1. Well, this is News Tonight, and my name is Kweku Timin. This will do for Insight, but we're coming back with packed local stories. Stay with us. We're back shortly. Insight is proudly brought to you by Pepsodent. With Pepsodent, every smile matters. In other local stories tonight, the leadership of the opposition National Democratic Congress as the NDC's leader, John Romani Mahama, has stated vehemently to stop the provision of free fuel and other benefits to top government officials if he is elected as the president after December 7th polls. Well, the former president cited cost-saving measures as reasons for his administration would implement such a policy. Well, this he said, well include cutting down incentives to government officials, addressing the European Union ambassador to Ghana. The NDC presidential candidate said only government vehicles purposely used for official duties would be eligible for fuel provided by the state. We will introduce measures that will stop our government and any future governments from wasting state funds, such as reducing the number of ministers and appointees, merging ministerial portfolios, will review and eliminate ex gratia payments in their current form. We'll also merge state agencies. There are several state agencies that are duplicating each other. And so where the functions are the same, we will bring them together and merge them. We'll discontinue the payment of utility bills, fuel, DSTV, etc., as conditions of service for top government officials, directors, and the political class. Uh, we believe that people should take up paying their own electricity bills and water, like every other Ghanaian does. And unless you're using a government vehicle on government assignment, you should buy your own fuel if you're using your own car. And so we're going to uh, discontinue that. Our budget will be to support small businesses and use tax as incentives for job creation. We'll end reckless borrowing, and we have a track record of responsible borrowing. In the four years that we're in government, we went on the euro bond market for 3.5 billion, and that is what we use for infrastructure, most for infrastructure development, and part of it for taking off high interest domestic uh, debt. All right, so if you're just joining us tonight, this is News Tonight. My name is Kweku Timmy. Well, we'll take a break at this point, but we're coming back shortly. We have several updates of stories for you, so keep your channel right here. We'll be back soon with more. Do stay. 
Well, thank you so much for keeping faith with us. We've brought you some judicial matters. We've also touched base on some political stories. It's now time for us to look at some social developments in here. Female peoples in deprived communities in some Jumako and Nyan SCM district. Female peoples in most of the deprived communities in the Jumako and Nyan SCM district are appealing to the government to consider introducing a free distribution of sanitary part policy. Well, their call follows the inability of most girls in rural communities to assess sanitary parts during their menstrual period due to poverty. The pupils from various basic schools in the Ejumako Enyan ACM district who participated in an event to mark the International Menstrual Hygiene Day at Bremen ACM said government should introduce the free sanitary part distribution policy just as it did for free SHS. They argue that they are unable to go to school anytime they are in their menses as they find it difficult purchasing sanitary pads. Hence, such a policy will help them. The government to bring us parts because the feeding fee and the free education sometimes not not anything that we don't pay. Sometimes we pay some things. So I will appeal to the government to bring us free parts or take away the taxes that are on the parts. They also appeal to the government to include changing rooms when putting up school buildings. We must change our piling every six, six minutes or one hour to the way. Or we need a bathroom to change ourselves every time. And also we need changing room for them. When they got the menstrual, then they will be good there for changing themselves. The girl child coordinator for the district who urged parents to support their daughters during their menses disclosed that over 600 packs of sanitary pads have been distributed to girls in the area. So when I posed a question and one girl answered that she has a lover just because of sanitary pads. The parents are not able to. And for that reason she has to go in for a boy to support him buying the sanitary pad plead that they reduce the tax on sanitary pad so that the parent can also be responsible. The Director of Education in the Jumaku Inyane CM District, Sabina Abba Wilson, who also spoke at the event, urged the pupils not to be shy during their menstrual period. She also advised them to shun exchange and sex for money to buy sanitary pads. Oh, mommy, I'm Monday. Catch all mommy, there, but soon i into almost ka na foko top pad men ka jiska e wo benyini bi ara ho Let's so stay on the subject as female peoples of the Kropon School for the Blind have received six months' supply of sanitary pads from the Lands Commission Ladies Association of Accra. What well, a donation, according to the association, is part of their contribution in making sure that pupils who are mostly from poor homes get access to sanitary pads, which is becoming expensive on the market. The theme for World Menstrual Hygiene Day 2024 is Period Friendly World, which is meant to advocate for all barriers hindering girls and women from going through their menstruation successfully are removed. To give meaning to this theme, members of the Lands Commission Ladies Association chose to support female pupils of the Akropong School for the Blind with assorted items including sanitary pads, washing detergents, soap, toilet rolls, among others. The target was to give to the disadvantaged in our society. That's why we chose Akropong School for the Blind. And we know there are young girls here. They also have issues when it comes to buying sanitary towels. So we thought it's wise today to bring them some sanitary towels to help them so that they can have good menstrual hygiene. Dr. Mans used the opportunity to appeal to the government to make an extra effort to reduce the cost of sanitary pads so that school girls can get access to them. 
Even the donations we do, we do it only periodically. It's not every day. And we don't even know how long it will last. So it's to be best that government puts in the stretches so that it becomes accessible to everybody in the rural community. So it shouldn't be a once a while donation. The vice president of Lakolas, Hajia Zainab Salifu, on her part, advocated for free distribution of sanitary parts to girls, especially in the rural areas of Ghana. When you look at people in the rural communities, it's very difficult to get 20 cities to, to afford a sanitary pad. And that is why most of the girls I have come into contact with in the schools, they use either rag or any unhygienic material when it's time, when is their time of the month. And so we still call on the government to do something about the sanitary. Personally, I wish sanitary part can be given to female students for free. Receiving the items on behalf of the school, the chairman of the donation committee, Joseph Su, expressed gratitude to Lacolas, adding that the items will go a long way to help the girls in the schools. Bringing us this sanitary pass today, in fact, is to go a long way to help our girls in the menstrual hygiene, to keep them neat. When it is time for their messes, they will not worry about where to get pad to use. So they will also feel comfortable in their classrooms to concentrate on their academic work. We say very thank you to you. We say I echo to the Lands Commission, ladies. Well, public health experts have warned that poor menstrual hygiene can pose serious health risks like reproductive and urinary tract infections, which can result in infertility, fibroid, birth complications, amongst others. Well, to help address this, touching the lives of Girls Foundation, Rick commemorated World Menstrual Hygiene Day with the female population of the Wesley Grammar Senior High School by educating them on ways to maintain proper menstrual hygiene, dispelling myths around menstruation and the distribution of free sanitary pads to the students. Speaking on the sidelines of the commemoration of World Menstrual Hygiene Day at the Wesley Grammar Senior High School, Municipal Director of Education, Fable Kuma North, Ebenezer Periofori, reiterated calls for government to supply free sanitary parts to primary and secondary schools. He is of the view this will help address the growing concern of poor menstrual hygiene among students. With all the education that we are giving, if the aspect of the path also comes in, at least it will, it, will, it will solve the problem. And I think the whole menstrual hygiene management will become complete and very effective. Touching the Lives of Girls Foundation, a non-governmental organization, has over the years focused on addressing these health concerns faced by many young girls in Ghana by taking them through proper ways of maintaining hygiene and distributing free sanitary pads to schools. This year, the Wesley Grammar Senior High School were the beneficiaries. Founder Nana Ama Educhumwa says this was born out of her near-death experience due to poor menstrual health. For the first six months, my mother didn't know I had had, I had, had my menses. So I was um, taking, I was using racks uh, because I didn't know how to take care of myself because nobody taught me about it. So I was using things on wholesome materials. And there are some things that I did which... Um, if it, it went untreated, now it's time to grow. So it was affecting my menstrual flow. And then I developed the likes of ovarian cysts and a whole lot of things. Many public health experts continue to advocate for the need to address menstrual hygiene openly in order to create an inclusive environment for all girls. World Menstrual Hygiene Day is a global initiative aimed at breaking the silence about menstruation and raising awareness about the importance of good menstrual hygiene management. All right, so that's about it uh, for some local stories. Very shortly, we move and bring you some business updates.
Right, so we appreciate Bill's microcredit for making it possible for us to bring you the business news. In business tonight, participants at the eighth edition of the Ghana CEO Summit and CEO's Excellence Awards are advocating for an increased public-private collaboration to foster synergy for economic development. Well, this according to the CEO's network, and when achieved, will take away on due pressure on government to allow for resilience and sustained prosperity in the country. Since its inception eight years ago, the Ghana CEO Summit and CEO's Excellence Awards has been an assemblage of CEOs and professionals from diverse backgrounds to share ideas, help shape policy directions targeting critical sectors of the economy, and also honor deserving CEOs for their distinguished performances in the year under review. Engaging the media on the sidelines of the event, the Chief Executive Officer of the CEO's Network Ghana, Ernest de Graft Ejri, said economic diversification is crucial for resilience and sustained growth, leveraging artificial intelligence. You need to have a market base. You need to have a niche for which you appeal to. You need to have a um, route to market strategy. So when the CEO Network was formulated, we saw that corporate Ghana need a platform to be able to showcase their competitive advantages. So most companies gravitate towards the Ghana CEO Summit because they see the platform as a decision-making audience. Speaking with GH1 Business, the chairman of Ghana Link Network Services, Nick Danso, operators of the integrated custom management systems, ICUMS, at the various ports of entry, indicated that their operations brought about an increased revenue mobilization to the government, as all loopholes have been plugged. You know, this is my system. We are always improving. Every day we, we have a team that go round, goes around to see what is happening, what is the new thing coming in. Let, let's say, for example, you are an importer. You can bring your goods and send it to Ghana Link. When Ghana Link gave you the final declaration forms to go and pay your duty, and you think it's too high, you just destroy it and go to another company, like maybe you could take now or be back. And you go and do work on your way to get cheaper. On his part, the Director General of the National Lotteries Authority, Sami Ewuku, highlighted the importance of engaging in community-centered development projects, taking into account the vulnerable in society. It's about the confidence that people also have in you. And so far, I'm excited that the trans my, my team has been a dedicated team that I've had the opportunity of working with. And so far, they've been amazing. And uh, I believe that working hand in hand with people to achieve this greater good for me is what has also kept me motivated. And I believe we brought that transform transformation into the industry. It has helped. And it's, uh, it's definitely a future that we need to look at more getting more revenue for the state. And the 2024 CEO Summit was themed reigniting business and economic growth, charting a path forward, economic diversification and artificial intelligence transformation, a private public sector CEO dialogue, and high impact, LEN. In other business stories tonight, the Ghana Plastic Manufacturers Association has begun impressing on the government to immediately suspend indefinitely the proposed 5% excise tax on locally manufactured plastic products. Well, according to the association, the excise tax will cripple the local industry, lamenting it will cost them an extra 380 million CDs monthly when the tax is implemented. Well, president of the Ghana Plastic Manufacturers Association was addressing a news conference earlier today. We wish to state the following. One, that the implementation of the 5% excise tax on X factory price of all locally manufactured plastic products and packaging be suspended immediately and indefinitely, that a better, deeper, and a broad-based stakeholder consultation is done on any idea of 
excise tax on locally manufactured plastic products. You see, plastic production is a high-tech process and therefore not a simple understanding for everyone. Three, that a well-defined locally manufactured plastic product list is established along with the appropriate guidelines to avoid any, any unambiguity of the law. We think this will not be fair if we are talking about a tax of that nature on plastic carry bags. Yes, we could talk about that. But why would you say that you want to put a tax on electrical pipes, conduit pipes, or PVC pipes that will carry water? I want to say a big thank you to Bill's microcredit for making it possible for us to bring you business news. That's about all we have for you tonight. Interesting bouts there. Well, that will close it for the evening. My name is Kweku Temin, bulletin led by Musa Lansa. On behalf of the entire production team tonight, we would want to salute you and appreciate you for staying with us. We'd also want to say tonight, brush with Pepsodin. Bring the family together and brush with Pepsodin. With Pepsodin, every smile matters. Enjoy the rest of your evening.